Hello, everybody. Welcome to another textile talk. Um, these are the organizations who come together to bring you a textile talk every Wednesday. Um, we are really thrilled uh, to have you here. We're now coming, I think this is our 103rd textile talk, um, and we are committed to doing another uh, 12 months of wonderful information about all kinds of different textile arts, fiber arts, and it's great to see everybody joining us. Um, as you're coming in, um, please post in the chat where you're signing in from. It's really exciting to see how global our audience has become. Um, altogether, we've had, I think, more than 17,000 people register for one or more textile talks and then thousands and thousands more watch them on YouTube. And it's so wonderful to see everybody joining together because of our shared love of fiber arts. As we have been planning all of the different textile talks, generally speaking, we rotate among the five organizations that you see posted here. But this um, last six months and then ongoing, we have been really excited to welcome other organizations to come and be our guests. And that's what's going to be happening today as we welcome the Virginia Quilt Museum from Harrisonburg, Virginia to be our guest speaker. But we, before we get started with their program, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about money. So I am Martha Seelman. I'm the executive director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. And all executive directors, one of our jobs is to raise money for the programs that we put on. And Textile Talks is no exception. The five organizations looked at what our budgets were for Textile Talks for 12 months, and it comes to slightly over $42,000. We have to pay for the Zoom platform. We have to pay for the email platform. We have to pay honoraria to our speakers. We have staffing costs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about, it's a little over $42,000. And as um, you'll see, we are very grateful to the corporate sponsors who have been underwriting our program. And right now we have around $34,000 rate pledged for the next 12 months. But that means that we need to ask you, our wonderful viewers, if you would also consider making a donation to underwrite the costs of Textile Talks. Lucy is putting the link in the chat. If you can make a donation, we really appreciate it. Um, because, as I said, you know, we have around $7,000, $8,000 that we still need to raise to cover our costs. So thank you for your consideration of my request. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Alicia Thomas, who is the director of the Virginia Quilt Museum. And she's going to be giving a wonderful presentation about their special exhibit about uh, art quilts that are made about endangered species. And if you saw any of the advertising for this program, you saw a wonderful, cute sea otter quilt by Ricky Selva, and she's gonna be here to talk about it. And um, it's one of a whole group of endangered species that Donna DeSoto brought, to, um, brought let me back up. Donna DeSoto brought together a group of wonderful artists who each chose an endangered species that they wanted to uh, raise awareness about. She's created a wonderful book, which she'll be telling you about, and this traveling exhibition, which is currently at the Virginia Quilt Museum. So I'm really excited to learn more about it. I have the catalog. I recommend you add it to your library. It's just a wonderful compendium of some amazing art and really fascinating information about the plants and animals that we share this world with. So Alicia, take it away. Thank you so much, Martha. That was a great introduction. 
here you can just see the sponsors of Textile Talk. So we do thank all of them for so generously sponsoring this. Most of these names are probably familiar to a lot of you. And also thank you to everyone who donates and helps support Textile Talks and all of the people that help support museums, whether it's a textile museum or a history museum, we appreciate that as well. So as Martha said, my name is Alicia Thomas. I'm the executive director of the Virginia Quilt Museum. I'm relatively new to this position. I've been here about nine months now. And so this is the first of Donna's exhibits that I've been able to see. And today we're going to do a couple of different things. I've got a short video walkthrough of the exhibit here at the Virginia Quilt Museum that I'm going to show you. And then I've got some slides of it as well, where I'll talk a little bit more about how we installed it and some of the challenges that we had because we're located in a historic building. And then I'm also going to interview Donna about her process of creating this exhibit. And then we also have Laura Robertson and Ricky Selva here with us. And they are two of the artists who have pieces in this show. So I'll be talking to them as well. So I'm going to switch my screen and share a different thing so that you can all see this great little video that shows the exhibit here at the Virginia Quilt Museum. executive director here, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this gallery tour of Inspired by Endangered Species, curated by Donna DeSoto. This exhibit features 182 quilts from 132 artists from around the world. Each quilt is 24 by 24 inches and depicts a different plant, animal, fish, or species that's endangered.
plants and insects and it's also the gallery that we just renovated so thank you to all of our donors who helped make that possible. that was a little video we made for this presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. And well, now I'm going to share back to my slide presentation. And that way, we'll take some closer looks at some of the quilts. And I'll just talk a little bit about how we hung the exhibit here and about the Virginia Quilt Museum. And please feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, I'll try to answer some as I go, but we're also hoping to have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is our lovely building. This is where we get to call home at the Virginia Quilt Museum. It is a historic building. It was built in 1856. It is the Warren Sipe House. We are right in downtown Harrisonburg and it's a great location. We do get a lot of foot traffic, uh, which is really nice. We get people who didn't even know we existed that just come in and end up visiting. So it's wonderful. This picture on the left is what you see when you first come into the museum. This is our beautiful entryway on our first floor. You can see we have lovely historic hardwood floors and to get to the endangered species exhibit you go up that lovely curving staircase and you enter into our upstairs hall and at the end of the hall are these windows and we have our gallery poster there and also these two books are the printed gallery guides we have as you probably noticed in the video we don't have traditional labels with this exhibit because we want, really wanted to fit all 182 pieces in. We didn't actually have enough room for wall labels for each one. So there are little numbers next to each quilt. And then we have printed gallery guides and we also have QR codes throughout the whole exhibit. So visitors can scan those and get the gallery guide. And that has the species that's depicted and also the artist listed. So this is the first group of nine pieces you see when you come up the stairs in the hallway. We did have to hang pieces three high, which I was a little worried about. They would be hard to see, but we haven't had any complaints and it looks really great. It's nice that everything is the same size. Um, all of the quilts are 24 by 24 inches, which made our lives much easier, um, not having to figure out where to hang different sizes or anything. This hallway was one of the easier rooms to install in because each of these spaces you'll see is roughly the same size. So we knew that we could fit nine in each space. So this is the next section. And then this is on the other side of the hallway. Um, and hanging in here is really easy compared to some of our other spaces. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we have, you can kind of see up here, we have these nice slats that just go above the doorway. So it makes hanging in the hallway really easy. We don't have to try and reach all the way up to the ceiling, which most of the second floor has 11 foot ceilings. And as a general rule, our staff is not very tall. We're all like five feet five, five feet six. So. <laughs> Reaching that 11 foot ceiling is sometimes a challenge. Here's the last group of birds and bats in the hallway. And you can see here we have one of our QR code signs. So we have at least one in each gallery. Some galleries we have a couple put up. 
And then you, here you can see we ran out of room in the plants and insect room and had to put a few of them out in the hallway. We gallery six through that doorway is where the plants and insects are. And it was the last room we hung and we just did not have enough space to fit all of them in there. But luckily we had this blank wall so we were able to put them out there. This is our large gallery upstairs. It's a room that used to originally be two rooms. So you'll see in some of the pictures, you can see where it was divided. And so this has the land animals and one of Ricky's pieces is here. The um, Amor Leopard is one of Ricky's pieces. So we'll hear more about that in a little bit. And then in this picture, you can see how we really tried to just use every inch of space we had available. We have this very strange shelf in a corner of this gallery space. I couldn't tell you why it was there. This building has had many, many lives. It was owned by the city for a long time. It was a private home. But we just haven't unfortunately been able to take the shelf out because it would pretty much destroy the plaster behind it and we don't want to have to repair that so it stays there but we managed to hang a quilt off of it and use that little bit of extra space. And this is another view and you can see a couple of things here not only do we have the window that we have to work around but we also have a fireplace. And then this fireplace also actually has a radiator in front of it. So these are all things we have to work around when we're hanging exhibits. And with this exhibit, it wasn't too much of a challenge because these are you know, 24 by 24 inches. So they're not a king size bed quilt that you're trying to hang over a fireplace or anything like that. But it can be a little bit challenging when we're trying to display, especially historical quilts that are very, very large and you're just like, we have fireplaces and we have radiators and we have windows everywhere. Where do we put things? So it's one of the challenges of being in a historic building, but we still love our home. Here's another view. You can see two radiators in this one. You can also see where this QR code here is where the room originally would have been divided into two rooms. And this also, this chameleon here, the uh, third one from the left on the top row is one of Donna's pieces, so we'll talk about that as well. So it took us about six days to install this show. Um, we did by no means worked eight hours a day on it. Uh, we are a very small staff. We have two full-time staff and one part-time person. So there were some days where we could only work about two hours on it. Other days we did work pretty much all day on it and it took about six days overall. Um, the last day was really just straightening and pinning things to make them hang a little bit more evenly and putting up the numbers and making sure we had the numbers in the right order and that they corresponded to the gallery guide. And then of course three days after we opened someone informed me four of them were wrong. <laughs> so I had to go in and change it and make some corrections. This photo also has uh, two more of Ricky's pieces. So the snow leopard here down in the bottom and then that otter that you've all seen in the advertising. And then this is a nice view. You can see where both of the doorways into this gallery are and the last pieces in the land animal room. And this um, is one of my favorite walls because it actually features three animals that have rebounded thanks to conservation efforts. So the American bison, the Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit and the elk have all come back from uh, the endangered species list due to conservation efforts. So it's a really inspiring little wall here that all three of them are grouped together. So next we're gonna move under the water and head over across that hallway and into the room that also features our historic sewing machines. And this is the one room where I will say things are a little bit closer together than we would ideally like. But again, we are just trying to get everything in. So 
we did what we had to do and it still looks really well and it's nice that everything you know is of a similar theme so it works here you can see one of our historic sewing machines and this room also only has eight foot ceilings. So in most of it, we only hung too high just to keep them from being too low. And here you can see another oddity that we had to work around. We have this glass display case here. Um, so we have some of our sewing machines and also just some other general ephemera related to quilting and sewing in there. And here another flower in this room and this one on the bottom left was done by Laura it's the mountain yellow legged frog and so we'll be talking about that a little bit later. And this picture gives you a really good idea of kind of how strange this room is. It also was divided into two very small rooms at one point we're pretty sure the city did that to make them into offices. And this space actually was my office until right before we installed this exhibit. We moved my office because people were coming into my office quite frequently while I was working because it was surrounded by gallery space. And so they thought it was another gallery and they'd just come in and I'd be like, hi, you know, just sitting at my desk doing paperwork. So um, it was also sometimes fun though, because I could hear everyone's unguarded opinions of what they thought of the museum because they didn't know I was up there. So this is our last little look at the water section and next we'll move into the insect and plant room. So here you can see this is a much bigger space. Uh, and again, it has the nice 11 foot ceiling. So we were able to hang three high here. And then one of the problems that we ran into in this room is we were actually running out of poles to hang off of. So you can kind of see in this that we actually have two sets of poles. There's three and then this row, each one is on an individual pole because we just ran out of long poles to hang on. So we were kind of piecing it together by the time we got to this room. These four are hung above another fireplace and this uh, pink one in the upper right hand corner or upper left hand corner, excuse me, um, is another one of Donna's pieces. And then these are only hung too high because there's another radiator here that you can't see. And this is by far the most challenging corner we have. This the floor in this room is just incredibly unlevel, especially in this corner, and then having to reach over the radiator as well. It's not our favorite place to hang things. We try to avoid hanging above it. We sometimes put a slant board in front of it to not have to get up on a ladder there. And then this is coming around to the last corner of the exhibition. You can see no radiators, no fireplaces. We were just able to nicely hang three high again. And then this is the last wall and that's all 182 pieces. And so Sylvia asked how many artists entered work and there are 132 artists represented and they're from across the United States, but also from around the globe. So next I'm going to talk to Donna DeSoto, the curator and author of the accompanying book. So welcome Donna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Uh, before time gets away from us, just seeing these quilts again, I'm so excited and I'm so happy that you all get to look at them and enjoy the way I've been enjoying them for a couple of years now. Um, thank you so much to all of the artists who said yes and who keep saying yes. I would be nowhere without all of you. So thank you so much. Thanks, Alicia, for the good job you all did at the museum. 
Oh, you're welcome, Donna. It was so much fun. And this is the fourth exhibit and project like this you've had, correct? You've done the Beatles, the National Parks, Elvis, and now Endangered Species. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how you started creating exhibits like this and the books that go with them? Sure, sure. So years ago, I volunteered for a job with my guild. Um, I belonged to the Fairfax chapter of Quilters Unlimited, and they needed somebody to do the chapter challenges. So that sounded like a job much more appealing to me than heading up the auction. So I said yes. Um, and I started coming up with maybe three different challenge ideas for each year. And I would throw a challenge out and see what would happen. And early on, um, a number of them were dead. So I would, I would throw out a challenge and maybe three people would stand up and show what they did in response to that challenge. But the more I listened to people and the more I watched people and saw what excited them, um, it wasn't too long before when it was time for show and tell of the challenges, the line of the people showing their quilts would wrap around our very large meeting place. So that got me more um, interested and excited about challenges. Uh, one day I was talking with some friends and we had heard that it was coming up on the Beatles 50th anniversary of their first concert in the United States. And with this trusty group of friends, I said, what if, what if we threw out a challenge? Um, everybody would pick a different Beatles song and they would depict that in a quilt. You think that would be good? And they got sparks in their eyes and they started jumping up and down and <laughs> telling what song they wanted to pick and could they get this song or that song. So I started my little list and I, said to a friend, you know, if we got 20 quilts, this would be a really cool exhibit. Well, the rest is sort of history because we ended up with 150 Beatles songs that were each depicted on a quilt. 150. Oh and my. That, that entire exhibit premiered at Houston. So I, I, I still just marvel at how many people said yes. It was a fantastic exhibit. It was a great way to kick off my start. Um, and somewhere early on when we realized how many artists were saying yes, my mentor, Mary Kerr, said, you know, my publisher might like this idea. So I got in touch with Schiffer Publishing and they loved the idea too. And and that's how Inspired by the Beatles turned into a book. Oh, that's so fun. And also, we love Mary Kerr at the museum, too. Yes. I just saw yes. her last week. She's wonderful. So can you walk us through a little bit the process of creating an exhibit and a book like this? You sure. start out with a topic, and then where do you go from there? Well, you have to you have to find the right topic, though. It's got to be a topic that people get excited about. Um, mm -hmm. You don't want a snoozer. You don't want something that sounds boring from the get go. So it's got to be a topic that grabs people. Um, and then you start a really good mailing list because I have become a collector of quilters. Uh, when I did my bio for Amazon and I wrote that I was a collector of quilters, Amazon fixed that to say that I was a collector of quilts. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. I collect quilters and that's really what I do. So I have quite a mailing list by now. Um, so you, you set out the guidelines and you send them to your mailing list and sort of throw it out into the quilting world and see what happens. And um, it, it's, it's just, it's just been great. Um, so people, people, hopefully they follow the rules and the parameters. Uh, <laughs> they deliver their quilts by the deadline. Um, that's when I start reaching out to venues to see who might be interested in showing the quilts. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm also working on the manuscript to complete the book. So, um, Several of these exhibits 
have been traveling for about four years now. So it's it's quite an involved process from the time that you put the idea out into the universe until you wrap it up. It's probably about six years per project. Oh, wow. This, you mentioned kind of the parameters. I know mm -hmm. for this one specifically, there was a size requirement, but what right. other parameters do you give people? You know, I, I always ask people to do their best work. That's important. Um, you know, curating is is a is a sticky thing. I I was not trained to be a curator. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. Um, but I I've learned my biggest lesson about curating the very first time I went to the Houston International Quilt Festival with the Beatles quilts. And I'll tell you this little story. Um, it was probably day two and I looked up and I noticed the same woman who had been there the day before walking slowly up and down, looking at every single one of those 150 quilts. And finally, I was just so curious and I walked up to her and introduced myself and I said, there, there are other quilts here. <laughs> you, you might want to see some of the other quilts. This is a huge festival. And she said, you know, she said, those other quilts make me feel like I don't even belong here. She said, yeah. I will never do quilts with that expertise. I am not a perfect quilter. Um, I, they just make me feel like, like I don't even belong here. But she said, when I spend time with the Beatles quilts though, she said she walked through and she would stop and see one and say, you know, maybe I could do that. And then she'd walk a little more. And she said, it was almost like visiting old friends. And she said, maybe, maybe she could be an art quilter. So anyway, Fung Ming, my, my brand new friend, who's from Singapore, by the way, um, she ended up doing a quilt for the Elvis challenge. And Fung Ming with her very first art quilt, this woman that I met in Houston with her friends, the Beatles quilts, she got a whole chapter devoted to her quilt in the Elvis book. So mm -hmm. my, the way I curate is I, I like to be encouraging. I like to people to believe that their work matters. It might not be perfect. It might, you know, not be what other um, curators are looking for. But if you follow the rules, which include the size limit, um, I ask people not to get political because I want my exhibits to be uplifting. Um, I know there are very important messages that we all want to share, but th that's for other exhibits. I, I want to share something beautiful. Wow. And then the other thing is these quilts, since they're going to be traveling for about four years, they have to be built very sturdily. So they have to withstand lots of shipping, lots of hanging and taking down. So. Um, and then the other, the other rule that's very important has to do with copyright, you know, when, especially like when we were doing the Elvis collection or the Beatles, um, stay away from copyrighted stuff. Just don't even go there. So that, that's, yeah, a I, I hadn't even thought of copyright issues, but yeah, with things like music, that's huge. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, how much it travels, and I know the pandemic really kind of threw this specific exhibit for a loop. I think we were supposed to have it in 2020, and the pandemic just kind of changed everything. So we just got it, you know, this, this winter, this spring. Right. So it is on display still at the Virginia Quilt Museum. We have it through July 15th, mm -hmm. but do you know where it's going after that? And if there are other places where people can see it, if they can't make it to Virginia for whatever reason. Sure, sure. Um, if you go to my website, it's www.inspiredquilts.com. I think maybe Lucy will put the address in the chat. Um, that's got the upcoming calendar. So the, the quilts are going to travel. The endangered quilts will travel probably, oh, another year and a half maybe um to to all over the place in the state so far i'm hoping to find an international venue but so far it's it's mostly the united states 
don't don't miss out on that national cornbread festival that's in Tennessee. <laughs> that's a big one, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. So, and if other museums or institutions are interested, they can just contact you. Yes, absolutely. Fine. I just can't tell you how much our visitors love this and rave about it. And when our visitors come in, we greet them and tell them what exhibits we have. And, you know, we always tell them it's upstairs and they always look kind of interested. But then once they come downstairs, they're just like, that was amazing. And yeah, it's incredibly well received and so fun. And it's really, it's a nice exhibit for us to have because it's very kid friendly. Like yes. kids yeah. love animals and yes. you know, quilts are not always the most kid friendly art medium. Right. Um, so that's been really great. And we actually, here in Harrisonburg, we have Explore More, which is a children's museum. It's literally a block away from the museum and they're actually gonna bring a couple of their summer camps to see it before we take it down. So that's gonna be really fun. Great, great. Alicia, you had asked about the biggest lesson I've learned in time. Yeah. Um, if, we can, if we can fit this in, uh, I, have a, I have a couple of big lessons I've learned. One of them is to trust caller ID. When your caller ID says Library of Congress, don't be a smart aleck like I was and pick up the phone and say, oh yeah, sure, this is the Library of Congress. It really was the Library of Congress and they wanted to exhibit the National Parks quilts. So trust caller ID. <laughs> and, and the other thing I want to mention is I have learned um, that quilting is a superpower. You know, if you were a quilter, you, you have so much power to make a difference in the world. Um, your quilts can be educational. They can be used. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find my notes. Uh, they, they can make a big impact on the world. Um, this in particular, this endangered species exhibit taught people a lot about species that are endangered that people hadn't realized before. And it also um, gives them ideas on what they can do to be proactive. So your, your, quilts, your quilts touch a lot of people. And there's also tremendous healing power in quilt making. Um, when we give quilts that we make to people to heal their hearts or heal their hurts. In the process, that also heals, our, heals us. And you, you just have so much power and you will not find a better uh, group of like-minded people than you will find in quilters. They are just the most loving, supportive group that you could ever find. So that's what I needed to tell you. Yeah, I, I will agree. Quilters are very welcoming. Um, I see we're getting a couple of questions in the chat about specific quilts and we'll get to those at the end. I do have a copy of the book here beside me. So we'll look up some of those answers. Great. And someone said the uh, book is out of print on Amazon, but it is available through Shipper, correct, Donna? Yes. I didn't realize it was out of print on Amazon, but- Or out of stock, if, yeah. If, if you contact Shipper Publishing, um, they, they can hook you up. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're coming to the museum, we do have a few copies left. I think we have nine left. Great, um, great. So. Also, if, if anybody is interested in doing the kind of thing that I do, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, find a mentor, find somebody who can help walk you through these steps. Uh, I've got another project that, that we're wrapping up. The, the book is coming out in, uh, August, and it's called Inspired by the Nation's Capital. But I was thinking about the past eight years with my fifth book published. Um, I've seen over 700 quilts go to 97 different venues. So I'm taking a little bit of a breather, but if this is something that you could get excited about, if you have an idea for an exhibit, um, do it, do it. I I'd be happy to mentor somebody, but I encourage you to, to go for it. Well, great. Thank you so much, Donna. And I'm sure we'll have some questions for you at yeah. the end. 
But now we are going to move on to talking to Ricky Selva, one of the artists who has pieces in this exhibit. So these are the four pieces you have, Ricky. So thank you so much for joining us. And do you wanna start by just telling us how you got started quilting? What led you to making quilts? Well, I actually started out as a photographer and a painter. And even though I spent like my entire childhood sleeping underneath quilts. So my mom was a quilter, my grandmother was a quilter. I didn't come to quilting until 1989 when I left the Air Force. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I found a way to merge painting, photography, and quilting into one. That's very fun. And I, I hear from a lot of people that they take up quilting after a major life change. A lot of people, once they retire, start quilting, or they did it when they were younger, but then take it back up after they retire. So what type of quilting do you like doing the most? Is it art quilts for you? Is it traditional quilting? That's a really good question. I'm almost embarrassed to answer it because um, I'm, I'm a dabbler. I, ah. I'm, uh, my, my biggest shortcoming as an artist is that uh, I don't have a consistent body of work because I want to try everything. And um, when I'm looking at the quilts, even now on the screen from, from the exhibition, I'm thinking, Ooh, I, yeah, I want to try, I want to try that. Um, so I thrive on challenge. I guess the only consistency in the whole thing is I like challenge. I want to try new things and I like storytelling. And so I like creating a piece that does tell a story. So that has to work really well with what Donna does. Have you had other pieces in any of the other shows Donna has done? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, I have to thank Donna. She's been a real blessing to me because, um, because I like to try everything, I lose focus sometimes. And until somebody gives me um, some, some, you know, focus, uh, some deadlines, and some <laughs> challenges, I'm really not into the project. I can't, I guess I call it being paralyzed by possibilities. So I'll sit here and I don't know what I want to do next, but Donna has given me challenges and deadlines. And so I've, I've produced quilts for her several times now. I had uh, two pieces in um, her inspired by the national parks exhibition. Um, and then I have two more pieces that are traveling around right now with the Inspired by Elvis exhibition. And since she mentioned the National Capital uh, uh, Project, I've got two pieces in that as well. And then four pieces in the uh, uh, in Endangered Species yeah. exhibition. So this is a question that a couple of people have asked, but I also wanted to ask you is about your technique, three of your pieces um, all look very similar and I've got slides of each of them so we can go through them but then your fourth one is very different so could you talk a little bit about the technique you use to create the three that look very alike? Well a little bit of a story on that um, I've been attending empty spool seminars uh, in California for about 12 years now and um, about eight years ago I saw Susan Carlson's work in person at empty spools. And uh, she uses collage to create images. But more importantly, I saw her students work and her students work was beautiful. So she was bringing out amazing things in her students. And um, I, again, I was like, I need to try that. I wanna try that. So what I learned, I've taken several classes with her. I started the Otter in a class with her. What I learned was that working in her collage style is a lot like painting. And so okay. by taking her classes, I was able to do what I love. I could uh, see something through my camera lens and then I could tell the story using a painting technique with textile. That's fantastic. So that's three for, of them. <laughs> yeah, for these three that you did, were you working off of pictures? Yes, Or okay. I was so lucky. I found pictures online and I contacted each, or, for two of them, I contacted the photographer and both photographers came back right away with permission to collaborate on the project. So I have to thank um, Valerie Abbott and Mike Baird for their, for their images. 
That's fantastic. Have you shown them the finished pieces? I have not because I lost their addresses until recently. So I do have to circle back around and, and let them know that, um, yeah, we, we had some success with the project. Yeah, they're fantastic. Thank you. And then this is your fourth piece that is clearly very different, but also beautiful. And it's, I looked through all the pictures my marketing team took and unfortunately I was really hoping they'd taken one kind of from the side because the manatee itself is pretty puffy. So that doesn't quite come through in this picture, unfortunately, but it does have some depth to it. Yep. So the manatee brought me back around to my love of, of painting. And I think the hardest painting to do is watercolor, especially working wet on wet. It's kind of a strategic um, game that you play with watercolor when you're trying to lay down the, the, the paint. And um, so that again, shows how much I like to dabble. Um, the manatee was painted on silk and it was painted on wet silk and it's in two pieces. The manatee is actually a separate quilt from the background. Um, and I just figured an aquatic animal needed a water treatment. So um, that's why she got painted. Yeah. And the, the eyes are beads, correct on this one? Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You did make this a while ago at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure they're beads. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I look at these every day, but those little details are hard to take in when you have so many of them. Well, thank you so much, Ricky. And I'm sure we'll have some more questions for you at the end. Now we're going to move on to talking to Laura Robertson, who has two pieces in this show. So thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Hi, Alicia. Um, so there is a thunderstorm rolling through where I am. So I'm going to apologize if anyone is hearing background noise about that. It's getting a little loud out there. So hopefully no one's hearing that. And hopefully my internet stays stable through this next you know, 15 minutes that we've got to um, wrap up. But Laura, can you tell us how you got started quilting? Totally by accident. Um, about 12 years ago, a friend of mine was going to teach a little class on at the local quilt store. She needed a guinea pig for the course. I hated sewing, but I happened to own a little old sewing machine. And so I grudgingly, very grudgingly agreed to be her guinea pig. And we made some, I mean, little tiny paper piece tart or something and I was at her house till two in the morning and it fell in love totally fell in love that next week I went out bought 50 fat quarters went to the library read every book I could find on quilting and that was it <laughs> so. that is fantastic um so along with being a quilter you are also a biologist correct I am yes um, so how did that impact your work on this project? Because those seem like for this one specifically, those it just meshes so well. It's kind of, yeah. Well, I'm a molecular biologist and uh, mostly uh, started it with fungi, did a little bit with aquatic um, organisms and then moved back to fungi. But uh, I have a huge appreciation of uh, field biologists, and I'm always delighted when I get to work with field biologists. And so um, not the piping plovers, but the frog quilt is actually uh, inspired by work that I did with um, a herpetologist investigating endangered uh, frog species in California. Um, but I think that quilting is an excellent way to tell stories, as Ricky talked about telling stories. Um, there's so many stories in biology, and quilts are just a very accessible, touchable way um, to bring people in uh, to some of these stories. And um, so I was delighted when I heard this uh, topic from Donna. This is right up my alley. So I was so happy she was doing this project. Yeah. 
how did you first hear about this project and have you had other works and others of Donna's shows? So I uh, met Donna through a mutual friend and uh, right before her national parks project. And I have two, or had, they come home. Um, I had two quilts in her national parks uh, project, which is also very near and dear to me as a biologist. And then um, this endangered species exhibit is, is delightful, so yeah. So both of your pieces kind of have messages that go along with them that you represented in the quilting. Do you wanna talk a little bit about those? So uh, the piping flowers, I call it going, going, gone. Um, it's supposed to read like a storyboard and you've got you know, fewer and fewer piping flowers left with the bottom panel being just a ghost, uh, just a thread outline of uh, of piping clever. And I also in the the that second line that's blue and brown, those the lengths of the pieces of fabric are SOS. Uh, so there's another hidden message in there. Mm -hmm. Piping clovers are actually um, increasing in population size again due to uh, active conservation management. And so that's a, a happier story than the uh, next quilt. <laughs> yeah, I know there's um, there's a couple of new national newer national parks that have piping clover breeding grounds in them that they protect really well. So hopefully mm -hmm. that's helping them out. Yes, lots of management activities helping. Yeah. And then next up, this is the mountain yellow-legged frog. Yes, and so you, you don't actually get to see the frog in this quilt. It's being eaten by the trout. Uh, so um, frogs and amphibians are really in serious shape. They are declining worldwide and we are losing species. We've lost a lot of species just in my lifetime. The major, major issue is a fungal infection that impacts the skin. Um, and it's a fatal, uh, potentially fatal skin infection, but that's not the primary threat for this species. This species lives in lakes up in the mountains and the lakes are naturally fishless, no fish at all. Um, but because people like to go fishing, uh, we stock these lakes. And so in the Sierra Nevada mountains, these lakes have been stocked with trout for about 150 years. And the trout are vor voracious predators and they eat both the tadpoles and the adult frogs. And so that's the major threat. Um, and this particular, as I was learning about this, they used to drive, um, you know, bring the fish up with mules. But after World War II, they started dropping the fish from airplanes. I couldn't believe this. They fly over and just dump the fish and they fall, <laughs> fall into the lakes. It's totally crazy. And uh, so that's what this quilt has. We've got our plane and the fish in that netting, which is supposed to look like the water uh, falling into the lakes and eating our frogs. So um, this species in, is in serious decline. Uh, it's been extirpated from 99% of its habitat. So it's oh, yikes. A, not a great story. Yeah, it's introducing new species as always. You never know what it's gonna do to an ecosystem, so. Exactly. Yeah, I, I grew up in Southern Michigan. So the Great Lakes have a lot of non-native yeah. species that are taking over and wreaking havoc that's and once they're there it's really really hard to get them out it is well thank you so much laura it was great to hear from you and we've got about five minutes left so we're going to go through some of the questions we got in and Donna, a question for you is, have you ever gotten a quilt that you didn't or couldn't accept for some reason? 
Um, I have. Uh, people don't always follow the rules. So <laughs> when I tell them, make sure something is not copyrighted and they make a beautiful quilt um, uh, and something tells me, go image search whatever that quilt is on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I find that exact image that pops up first thing when I do a search. Um, that that's that's the biggest sin is if you, if if you ignore the copyright stuff um especially where the beatles and elvis was concerned yeah um, but yeah sometimes the quilt doesn't photograph well um you know there there are different reasons why quilts are turned down but they're not turned down very often i can tell you that my my exhibits are huge yes how many pieces do you have in the national park or in the national capital, the next one you're working on? There are 103. Okay. And, and that collection will premiere at Houston this year. Um, and it's uh, the exhibit schedule is already filling up. So that's great. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking through the book here. I have my copy here that I've been carrying around with me for most of the past week as I've been getting ready for this. A couple of people have asked um, if some of the quilts are mixed media or what techniques were used. And I can tell you from seeing the exhibit in person, it's pretty much every technique you could think of is probably in one of these quilts. There are some that are painted, um, some are appliqued, some are pieced. It's a little bit of everything. One of the really nice things about the book is at the back, it, there's, um, it tells you there's a little blurb about each quilt so you can see what the techniques are. Um, so yeah, and I see Martha's popping back in. So that means we're we're running out of time, I think. Yeah, yeah but um, I wanna thank all of you so much. Um, Laura, I thought that the dropping the fish out of nets was <laughs> horrifying. Um, it's bad enough that, you know, we're putting fish into places that they don't belong, but that we're using airplanes to do it. My goodness. Um, I certainly learned a lot reading through the book. If you're at all interested in endangered species, you need to get a copy. Um, a number of suggestions as to where to get one um, have been posted in the chat. Um, you learn a lot about the species. You learn a lot about the artists. Donna has done another phenomenal job in bringing together artists and art about an important topic. And I uh, will be going down to Houston and I can't wait to see the new exhibition there. Um, thank you all so much. It was so great to see the quilts in the museum. It's a really different experience than seeing them one by one in the book. And it's just wonderful to see how the pieces play off against each other. Alicia, thank you so much for pulling this program together. Um, it was just a wonderful experience for everybody here. And then finally, I wanna thank our sponsors again. Um, we will be adding our new corporate sponsors to the thank you slide starting next week once we've got it all put together. And so far we've had 26 people make donations to support Textile Talks. I hope that you will consider also making a donation. We still have $7,425 to go and we need your help to get there to pay for these wonderful programs. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's always wonderful to be part of this enthusiastic fiber art, textile art, quilt art, loving community and to have everyone join us. Don't forget to check out all the recordings on YouTube. We love to have you be part of what we're putting together. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you, Martha.